Greetings. I want to welcome you as we continue our journey in this year, the 500th year of the Martin Luther's posting of the 95 Theses on the uh, Castle Wittenberg, there at the, well, actually the university. It's a very uh, monumental year, an anniversary of something that is so great that helped bring back to Christianity this wonderful truth. And as we journey through now, uh, Romans 7 and Romans 8, I invite you to open your Bibles and be, as we begin our study. But before we begin, let's just start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we've seen in the past chapters, Paul is making the forceful argument that we are now, that we are saved by grace. That the law was meant to add condemnation, but God's grace superseded that. It hyperextended over, over our sin. And now Paul is going to get into the war within in chapters 7 and 8. And what goes on? How do we overcome sin then? Do we just try harder? And this is what he starts off with. He starts off with a, an analogy about marriage. And, he asked, and, and we'll read from uh, verse 1 in chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that is, he was writing to people that had an understanding of God's law, that the law has authority over man only as long as he lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to, once, to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now Paul here uses an interesting analogy from, from marriage and he asks, who are we married to? Are we married to the law? He says, absolutely not. We've died to that. We are now married to Christ. It's a very interesting analogy that once uh, the law, uh, once a, a husband or wife dies, they're freed from the law. I mean, they're freed from their marriage. They can now marry another. And because of Christ's death, we are now, because of the uh, power of the law, and he had to die to fulfill the requirements of the law. But now that he's died, we are freed from that and we are now married to him. And now Paul says we don't serve according to the old way of just analyzing every little part of the law and trying to obey it on our own and trying to overcome on our own. Now we are married through the Holy Spirit to Christ. It's a very interesting analogy. And we continue on from verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. So Paul now wants to clarify because some people say, well, if we died to the law, that means the law was bad. That we've, we've died to it. The law was bad. It was evil. It was from the Old Testament. And Paul says, absolutely not. That's not the case. And he'll make his point here. For I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had said, do not covet. He's talking about Ten Commandments, right? But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, 
and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. So what is the problem? Is the problem the law? Should we blame the law and say, well, the law is bad. Yeah, oh, it's just all the, for all those old Jews in the Old Testament. Absolutely not. Paul says the law is good. The commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So there's nothing wrong with the law, but what is wrong is that battle within. Sin inside of us sprang up. That is when we know the commandment, it actually, as, as he put it, produced in him a covetous desire when it said, do not covet. So the law said, don't do that. And what did it do? The sin inside of him actually produced that exact desire that it was supposed to be overcoming. And then Paul talks about it in very interesting terms, starting in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So here he is, back to the, the slave analogy. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, that I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I want, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now you have to remember who's talking here. The great Saint Paul, the great missionary. This is somebody who we regard as holy, as somebody who'd seen Jesus face to face, as somebody who uh, helped establish the Christian church more than almost any other person in the history of Christianity. So this is Paul talking, and he says he finds in himself this war. And he says, I understand the law is good. I understand I need to do that. He said, I want to do it. And I go to do it. And that I want to do, I don't do. I actually do the things that I hate to do. So how do we overcome? I mean, Paul says it. Who, woe to me. I mean, who, who will deliver me from this, this wretched state? I'm a wretched man. Who will rescue me from this body of death? It's a terrible predicament. And it's one that, it's actually for the believer. An unbeliever is just living in the sinful nature and doesn't realize the sinfulness of sin. Paul understands the law. He understands uh, the spiritual nature of the law. He wants to obey God's law. And when he does try to obey it, he sees it's good. And Paul describes th this terrible condition that it's actually the sin living in me. He says, it's not I who do it, it's the sin living in me. So once we are aware that we're sinners and we come to God, there's still that old remnant of sin that still springs up within us. Now do you see where Paul is going with this? Because in verse 25, he says this, But I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. So Paul acknowledges he's a wretched man, and who will deliver us? Do you see the terrible effects? If you take away the law in this equation, you'll never realize the sinfulness of sin. God gave the law so that we would recognize the sinfulness of our nature, so that we would recognize we're in desperate need of a savior. If you get rid of a law, as Paul says, then there's no sin. And then you don't recognize your great need for a savior. And he praises God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who rescues us. And he goes on in chapter 8. 
therefore, so we're, we're concluding after chapter 7, this war that's within us, this war that when we want to do good and we, we try to do it and we can't do it, we continue to do what's wrong. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. So Paul, it's wonderful news. It's good news in Romans 8, 1. He says, therefore, if you are in Christ Jesus, because he's crying out, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? He cries out to, cry, to God. And he says, through Christ Jesus, I praise him. Why? Because now, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you understand that Christ has to deliver you from this body of death, there is now no condemnation. God is not condemning us. Even when that sin that just pops up in us when we come to the commandment. Paul said, I, I came and said, do not covet. And he says, what happened? I started to covet. But he says, if you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for that. Why? For the law of and this is verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. So there's a spirit of life and a spirit of law and of sin and death. So the old commandment, yes, it points to what we should do, but there's no power in it to help us actually do it. What helps us is the law of the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit that he helps us to overcome when we come to him. There's no condemnation now. We come to him and it's his Holy Spirit that does it and it gives life to us. And it helps us uh, in our weakness because in verse three, that's exactly what he talks about. He says, for what the law was powerless to do and then it was weakened by the sinful nature. That is the sinful nature was so weak. We came to the law, we asked, well, you know, okay, don't covet. And what does Paul do? covets. It was weakened. So what did God do? He met the righteous requirements of the law through his son, through Christ. That is in Christ, in his claiming his life and death as our own. There's no condemnation and we, the righteous requirements of the law are already met in us through him. It's a mystery. It's a beautiful one. And it's one that we are called to proclaim as a church and to tell people about. Why? Because it's, it really is good news. And this is what Paul says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what, nat what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. For the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled, and here he talks about control, marrying yourself, uh, by the sinful nature cannot please God. So in our sinful nature, even when we're trying to obey the law, we can't please God. Why? We're weakened. We can't do it. So we come to the law and, okay, it says don't covet. I'll, oh, I'm coveted. If we're controlled by our sinful nature, and if God just said, oh, yeah, sure enough, they tried to obey the law, they couldn't, we can't please them. We can't produce the fruit, because that's not God's character, is to covet, and yet Paul says, I started to covet. The law told me not to? Okay, I'm not going to covet. Oh, I coveted. What do you do? God understood we were weakened, and he reached down, and through Christ made it possible and actually made it a reality to meet the righteous requirements of the law. Not only possible. So I ask you this morning, whose mind do you have? Are you controlled by the sinful nature? Are you still trying to obey in your own power? 
Or are you coming to God and asking for the Holy Spirit on a daily basis and living in Christ as he helps you overcome and makes you righteous? So starting in verse 9, it says, and this is what Paul says, you, so he's talking to the people he's talking to, which would include you because you're listening to his letter. And Paul says, you, however, are not con are." Controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. So here we have a great text. Paul says, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will live in you and enable you to walk with God and to be in Christ. This is a gift, and this is what Paul's been talking about. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So this is a gift. We just ask for it, and we believe it, we claim it. We reckon ourselves, as Paul says, just consider yourselves dead to sin and walk with God. And God will give you the, the power to overcome in his power. And this is what Paul says, verse 12, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by this Holy Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So who are we debtors to? Does Paul say we're, a, we're debtors to this sinful nature? Absolutely not. He says we're not, we don't, we're not in debt to that. We're in debt of gratitude to God. Because of what he did through Christ. Through making us righteous in Christ. So we live according to that spirit. And then he says this. We're actually... Sons of God, we've been adopted. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, or Father, which actually means Daddy in Aramaic. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are God's children... Then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So Paul says we have a new spirit now. God's willing to give this new spirit. And it's the spirit of being a son or a daughter of God, of crying out to him, Daddy, Daddy. This is, I believe, what David was talking about in the Psalms when he talks about blessed are those who take refuge in God, who cry out to him. They're not afraid of him. They realize, as Paul realized, woe unto us, woe are, you know, unto us because we're wretched people. Who will deliver us from this body of death? And we cry out to God for life, for salvation. And this is the Spirit of God prompting us in, in this to cry out. Why? Because he's adopting us. He's taking us as his own. Isn't this beautiful? And then Paul starts to get into sufferings. And then he says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our, our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So Paul says that there's hope. Why? Because the whole creation, and here he's even talking about the animals, the trees, everything is in bondage to decay, as he says. That is, we're all 
in these bodies of suffering. We all get sick. We all have, have to face death of loved ones. The whole creation is in this, this bondage that, that came with, with sin and decay. And Paul talked about that earlier in the chapter of how sin came through one man, through Adam. That is, we're all part of this great pool of suffering. And yet, he says, the creation is eagerly awaiting the sons of God to be revealed. That is, God is waiting. God wants us to have this spirit, the spirit of sonship, of, of being a daughter of God, of crying out, Daddy, Daddy, help me. And he's, he's right there. This, this is the hope that we have. Obviously, the greatest hope is the second coming. Why? Because it wraps it all up, and then we have immortal bodies, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. That is the immortal close over the, the, uh, the mortal bodies that we have. This is a great hope. And Paul says that yes, we have sufferings, but we even rejoice in that, and we actually participate in the sufferings along with Christ. And this is what the Holy Spirit does for us when we cry out. This is why we really don't even understand it, and Paul acknowledges it here in, in 26. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So Paul's basically in chapter 7 and 8 showing we're weak. We come to the law. We, it says, uh, don't covet. What do we do? We start coveting. And, and Paul encourages us. He says, you know what? The Holy Spirit understands and helps us even in our weaknesses. For we do not even know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. What is God's will? God's will is to help us, to make us his children. And therefore, the Holy Spirit does everything he can when we come to him. You don't know what to pray? It's okay. Pray whatever on your mind, on your heart. Why? The Holy Spirit will help you. Even the Holy Spirit guides us. So it, Paul later says the Holy Spirit is the one that works in us to do and to act. This is why Paul told uh, the Philippians, please work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Come to God. With fear and trembling of what? Your own weakness. That you might walk away from God. Ask for the Holy Spirit to intercede on your behalf and, and help you in, in your weakness that you don't even really understand. And it's right after that, Paul gives one of the greatest promises of Scripture. And he says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What a great promise. Paul gives it right here. Or he said, yeah, you know, if you think you've had something bad happen in your life, don't worry. You come to God in your weakness, he'll take that and turn that into a, that curse into a blessing. I mean, look at our whole world. You know, maybe we just would have been another planet living away from God in heaven. And, and what does the Bible say? Satan wanted to keep us away from God and he got us to fall in sin. And what ends up happening? God actually says he'll bring the, you know, new Jerusalem down here and he'll live amongst us. We'll actually be closer to God because of all this. That is, the curse was taken into a blessing. And we can say, see the same thing in our own personal lives. Bad things that have happened to each one of us. Probably decisions we all regret. Embarrassing episodes of our life. And yet Paul says all things work together for God. When we come to him in prayer, understanding our weakness, that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf, that all things work together for good. And then he talks a little bit about predestination. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So what did God predestine for all of us? To be made in the, remade, in the, and be conformed to the image of his Son. That is, to be remade in the image that he created us in Genesis 1. Now, some Christians, we take this predestination and, and you know, starting with John Calvin. Well, some, the saved were called to be saved and the ones that are, are lost were, were called to be lost. They were predestined. 
Now, God wants everybody to, I mean, Peter says God is patient. He wants every person to be saved. That why? He's predestined. He, he wants that. When Jesus came, he, he justified everybody. I mean, it didn't just justify the Jews or just the special, special select group. Jesus justified humanity. Now we can choose to accept that, reject that, and be and accept this gift of salvation in the Holy Spirit. We can accept it or we can reject it. But it's never because God said, well, that person, maybe they're not worthy to be in, in heaven. And then Paul goes on. One of the greatest passages of Scripture here. We'll read to the end of the chapter. What then shall we say in response to this? So Paul's wrapping it up. I mean, these, these wonderful spiritual truths, our weakness, our, our bondage to sin, this, this wretched person that he was, and yet God reaches down and sends the Holy Spirit, adopts us as his children, makes us just in Christ, and then helps us in our weakness to overcome. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who? can be against us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, uh, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, what can separate us from God? Paul says, I'm convinced, nothing, nothing save ourselves. The love of God and reaching down to humanity in justifying a, a wicked, rebellious planet, weakened in the sinful nature, that even when we want to do good, we come to God and we're powerless to do it. Unbelievable love. And he sends his spirit, he sent his son, justified us, called us, and is ready to glorify us and make us his gl glorious children. What a wonderful invitation today. If God gave up his own son. For, and, and Jesus went through the grave under, with not understanding if he was going to see life again. Thinking this is eternal separation from his father. If God was willing to do that on our behalf. Will he graciously not help us with the problems we're facing today? I appeal to you. Come to God through Christ Jesus. Thank him. Praise him. The Bible says he will deliver us from all our fears, from all our troubles, and he will be with us. And we understand he will never leave our side. Come to him today in your weakness. And the Holy Spirit will intercede on your behalf. Ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ask for the gift of salvation. For if you have the Son... You have life as the reformers in the 15 and 1600s loved to say. And the church said, no, no, you'll never understand if you have that grace. No, when we come to him and we claim the promise, he has said he'll be with us. Will he not graciously give us all things? For if God is for us, who can be against us? Walk with God today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture. Your word that you gave us to sustain us. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will help us in our weaknesses. Lord, we are weakened in the sinful nature. 
but may your spirit live in us. May, you, may we cry out to you, even though we may face death all day long as the Apostle Paul did in his ministry. But we are more than conquerors through you, through your love for us. We praise your name and we ask you to be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.